One of the other things I just would like to point out is if I was to select one of these clips and go back into its history, one of the useful parts of the history is obviously it keeps the sources when the options turned on. So to illustrate this, if I just switch back to the desktop, you can see that the original shot is just the final render. I don't have any of the original sources on me. Perhaps they might have been deleted off the system. Nevertheless, if you rendered a clip with history and kept the sources, one thing you can do is when the history is open, you can simply select the clip within clip history and press the match or forward slash button on the keyboard. This will match the footage out of this clip history out onto the desktop. So you can now see how I've now got the original source. It also works very similar to being able to match a clip out the timeline when doing match frame editing when you're doing any editorial work. So clip history can be very useful from this point of view. The third and final thing about looking at clip history is to see how clip history actually works in the timeline with soft effects. So here we've got a timeline and inside here I've already got a composite built where we've basically got a surfer going under a bridge and over a tidal wave. Now, one thing to point out is in order for this to work very successfully, I've made sure that my focus point is at the very, very top and I'll show you why. Let's say you're in a situation where you're using the soft effects on the timeline. So in this case, if I go all the way down to the bottom, I've simply got my original background where I've got some waves. I then go up to another layer where I've composited a surfer. That surfer has then been composited with some text on another layer. Finally, we add the balcony and then I've got a very dull color correction applied on top of the composite. So you can see how I've actually used the timeline to build the composite for me. However, one of the things that sometimes can be a little bit frustrating when working with effects that are in the timeline is navigating through them. So I'm going to give you an example as to how useful even clip history can be when working with the timeline. So what we can do is we can select, let's say for example, the color correction on top. And I'm going to go into the color correction editor. So to fix this up, what I'm simply going to do is possibly just add a little bit more contrast and maybe play around with the black level. So I've basically done my tweak to make it look and stand out a lot better. But now I've decided what I'd like to go ahead and do is I'd like to go ahead and edit the text that is already there in the timeline. Now normally you would think maybe I should just exit back to the timeline view and then go into the text tool in the timeline. So that's a lot of bouncing in and out of modules. Well, the great thing is you can see that there is a history button and the history button is in every soft effects module. When you click on this, it brings up the history view as well. Now, because these soft effects are flexible in the timeline, you could actually use these to navigate where you're going. So right now the highlight tells me I'm on the color correction, but if I come down to the text effect and I double click on this, it then takes me into the text editor. Now I can look at this with the actual text itself or I can go ahead and view the contextual view. Now one of the things as I mentioned that focus point must always be at the topmost layer in the timeline. This is because the contextual view looks at the focus point. So if you've got it on layer one and you turn context on you're not going to see anything. So make sure the focus point is at the top set to context and then this function will work nicely. Now in this case what I'd like to do is maybe just edit the text. So while I've got in edit mode I'm going to go surfs up and we'll just type in dude. You can see obviously that that's taken on the changes and the transformations I've made and now I think okay fine we're looking good at that maybe I need to go into another part of history. So we can go into maybe the composite for the actual uh, top area and inside you can see here's my key where I've created a mat, I've got garbage masks and so on and so forth. Once I'm done navigating all the different tools, we can simply come back out the timeline and all the changes that I've made have all been applied to the various different layers inside the timeline. So you can see this is a very, very fast tool for very quick turnaround. If I've got lots of layers and I simply want to navigate in a more tree-like structure without having to go in and out of the timeline as I'm busy doing stuff all the time. So this just gives you a really good idea as to how this could actually then work. So hopefully this has given you a real good idea as to how clip history actually works with inside of Smoke and how you could definitely use it to your advantage. So just to summarize up, there's a few key points that I would like you to remember. Firstly, clip history can keep everything. So it can store the final render, it can also store all the metadata, all the settings that are used to create the render as well as the sources. You need to be aware that this can actually increase the size of the clips on your storage as well as increase the size of your archives when you're working. With that in mind, one of the advices I give to people when they're working 
is if you're going to be using a large source. So say for example, you capture in a 10 minute clip and you're only using two seconds as part of your composite, remember to consolidate your source before you start using it. This means when it comes to backing up archiving or moving media between smoke systems, then what will happen is the system will try to transfer the entire two, 10 minutes, an hour's worth of material when you could actually save yourself a little bit of time. So a little bit of housekeeping is required on your part to ensure that you just consolidate before you actually start working and using clip history. Remember, clip history is saved with the clip. So wherever the clip goes, the history goes with it. So you actually do not have to save your setups because it always gets stored. But I'm the type of person who always likes to have backups of my backups. Remember to save your setups. Even though Clip History works very well, save your setups as a backup. Please do not get complacent or lazy. It's always good to have as many backups to fall on if the other one should by chance accidentally fail. The one thing I showed you is version with layers in history. So if you were to take a clip with history into the record area and you alter the history, sometimes it's not very possible to go back to the original version if you've rendered over the clip. So versioning with the layers in the timeline before you make a new version of your clip is a very useful thing to remember, especially it could also be used to show clients version A, B, and C. So finally, remember to keep it all in the timeline. Smoke's timeline editorial is something that we use every day. Everything works around the timeline and by keeping the clips with the history in the timeline, when you back the timeline up and it comes to restore it or if you need to get back to it, every setting is inside there and you don't have to go searching for everything. Hopefully this will allow you to understand how clip history works within the application and you should start using it and really embracing some of the flexibility that the clip history has to offer. If you want to know any more information about Autodesk Smoke, or you'd like to download the free 30-day trial copy, just go to autodesk.com forward slash smoke for Mac.